Okay, guys, so sorry about that, that the Q&A fell through. Everything else has worked today. We were on yesterday, did the Q&A, but I know a lot of you guys were waiting for today, so so sorry about that. All right, so we have these eight problems, actually seven, because I took one out. Um, number one, if J, or find JL, if JK is blah, 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 KL is blah, 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 and K is the midpoint of JL. So if I have a line segment, that was not a straight line, J, L, and right here in the middle is K, First thing I know, if K is the midpoint, is that the midpoint of a line segment separates that segment into two smaller congruent segments. So JK is the same size as KL. It also tells me that JK is X minus, or sorry, 17 minus X, and that KL is 2X minus 7. So I have to, based on that information, find the length of this entire line segment. So first thing I'm going to do is set these equal to each other and solve for x. 17 minus x equals 2x minus 7. This is just algebra. Get rid of the smallest x. These go away. 17 equals 3x minus 7. Now I have to get x alone. 24 equals 3x. And then lastly, I need to divide both sides of my equal sign by 3, and I get uh, 8 equals x, or x equals 8. Okay, well, that's all fine and good, but it doesn't ask me to solve for x, right? It asks me to solve for the length of jl. So now that I know what x is, I can plug it into both of these, right? 17 minus 8 is 9. 2 times 8 is 16 minus 7 is 9. And that makes sense because they're both equal. So the entire thing, JL, is made up of JK, which is 9, plus KL, which is 9. So 9 plus 9 equals 18. JL equals 18. And our answer choice for that is D. I'm not going to bubble in. All right, next one. Number two. For What's another name for angle DFE? DF, F's here, but it's this little dot right here. E, that would be angle four, J, angle four. Number three, classify angle one if the measure of angle one is 115 degrees. So remember a right angle is equal to exactly 90, an acute angle is less than 90, and an obtuse angle is greater than 90. There is no such thing as a scalene angle, that's just talking about a type of triangle, so that doesn't even work. Right? So our angle is 115, that's greater than 90, so ours is obtuse. Number four. Uh, what can be assumed from the figure? So looking up here at this figure, same thing, what can be assumed? That angle one and three are congruent. Well, no, they're actually not necessarily congruent. Congruent angles, these would be like vertical angles, and vertical angles are made when two straight lines intersect each other. So look, we see all of angle one here. This would all be equal to all of this angle across from it. But no, angle three and angle, whatever angle this is with the F in it, these two angles together add up to this whole thing. One is the entire thing on its own. So one and three are not equal. Three is actually smaller than one. So that doesn't work. What about G? Angles two and four. Well, here's angle four. Here's our two straight lines I highlighted in pink. Here's angle two. Yes, they share a vertex. This angle and this angle are vertical angles. Looks like a bow tie. So they are the same size. So G is correct. BF and FE are congruent. We can't assume that from here because we're not given any measurements. And CF is perpendicular to BE. It does look like that. Here's CF. BE is this line. They do look like they're 90 degrees, but without that little box in the corner, we can't assume anything because it might be 89 degrees or it might be 91 degrees, right? We don't know. So we can't assume this one. So the only thing we can assume we know is true is G. Number five, find the perimeter of a regular octagon, regular octagon, if one of its sides is X plus six and another side is 14 minus X. So why do they tell us it's a regular octagon and what does that have to do with any of this? Regular octagon has eight sides and all eight sides are equal. That's what makes it regular. 
So if two of the sides are x plus 6 and 14 minus x, I can set those equal to each other because they've got to be the same size if it's a regular octagon. So I get rid of my smallest x, subtract 6 from both sides, Divide by 2, x equals 4. So if I plug that back into either of these sides, 4 plus 6 is 10, 14 minus 4 is 10. So either way, I know that the sides of my octagon are 10 units, and there's 8 of them that are all that same size. So 8 times 10 is 80. My perimeter is 80 units. Okay, number 6. Oh, that's the one we skipped. Sorry, I just hit my phone. Um, we skipped number six. It's from lesson 2-3. We started chapter two in 2-5. This is a conditional statement. You actually should have covered this in your, I think, eighth grade math class. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're going to skip over that one for now and go right to seven. Which statement is always true? Well, without having looked over any of the notes for postulates and paragraph proofs, um, which statement is always true? We can kind of use logical thinking here. Is it always true that x equals 2? No, x could equal anything, right? That's not always true. Is it always true that x equals itself? Yes. If x is 17, it's going to be equal to 17. If x is negative 1 half, it's going to be equal to negative 1 half. That is always true. Is x always equal to y? Sometimes, but not always. And is x never 0? Is that always true that x can't be 0? No, x can be zero all day long. So the only one that we know is always true is b. And then the last one we're going to do on this little review that's from chapters one and the beginning of two is number eight. If angles one and two are congruent, and then that same angle two is also congruent to angle three, which of the following is a valid uh, conclusion? Which of these three choices, right? Well, if angles one and two are congruent, doesn't that mean that their measures are equal? Yeah, we have two angles that are the same size. That means if one of them is 30 degrees, the other one's 30 degrees. So their measures would be equal, that is true. If angle one is congruent to two and that same two is also congruent to three, can't we cut out the middleman and say that one and three are congruent? Yes, that's the transitive property. Cut out the middleman. And then lastly, if all three angles are congruent, can we say that the measure of angle one plus angle two adds up to angle three? No. If each angle is 30 degrees, 30 plus 30 does not equal 30. That doesn't work. So the only two that work are one and two, H. Okay, the rest of that just gets further into chapter two, and I just put up all the notes and everything for chapter two yesterday. Um, so like I said in your lesson videos, I'm giving you through Sunday. As long as you have everything submitted by Monday, you won't get any points off. Um, since I put them up so late in the week, I just wanted to give you a little bit of extra time if you wanted it. Um, so go ahead and work on that. And I wanna review just really quickly proofs. That's my video, eight and a half minutes. Okay, I gotta hurry. Proofs. All right, when we set up a proof, a proof is just kind of a logical thought progression on how we get from one fact in math to another fact, okay? So we always start with a given. We'll always be given some true statement. It is a fact, <clears throat> excuse me, fact. So let's say that we're given uh, 4x minus 7 equals 1. Let's say that's our given fact. And based on that fact, we have to prove something else. So in this case, we're going to have to prove that x equals 2. Okay, so that's what we have to, that's all we have to do. Seems easy enough, right? This is an algebraic proof. So when I set up my two column proof, I'm going to write statements in the left hand column, and it's going to look like a big T chart, and reasons in the right hand column. Statements are just our steps. When we solve in math, all those steps go over here under statements. Reasons are the rules that we use in math, why we do each step, okay? So I'll show you what I mean. Step one, we don't know where to start, right? Where, like, what do we do? Whenever we create a proof, you always, always, always start with the given. So the given statement is 4x minus 7 equals 1. And what's our reason for using that? Because that's what was given to us. 
So number one is always, always, always the given. Okay, so what's the first thing that I need to do in order to solve for x here? If my prove is that I have to prove that x equals two, how do I start solving for x, right? First thing I wanna do is get rid of minus seven. So I'm gonna add seven to my equation. So I'm gonna put four x minus seven, and I'm gonna add seven. And whatever I do on one side of my equal sign, I know I always have to do the exact same thing on the other side to keep both sides equal. So why did I just add seven to both sides? Because of the addition property of equality. And these properties are given to you in lesson two six. Addition property of equality, properties, there's like probably, I don't know, what, six or seven, something like that, properties that are given to you. So you're gonna start by using just those properties given to you in that lesson. So there's some given to you in lesson two five, some given to you in lesson two six. You need to keep track of all of those. These aren't properties that, okay, once we move on to the next lesson, you can forget those. No, this is like an ongoing tally. We're gonna keep track of all of these properties, okay? So here, we added seven to both sides because of the addition property. So what happens when I add seven to both sides? Now I need to simplify it, right? So the sevens cancel each other out here, and I'm left with four x. And here, one plus seven is the same thing as eight. So why did I just rewrite 4x minus seven plus x seven equals one plus seven as 4x equals eight? Because of the substitution property. Anytime I simplify something, the reason is always because of substitution. When I replace something in math with something of the same value, that's called substitution. One plus seven is the same as eight. I just made it look nice and clean. Instead of having two different numbers added together, now I have one number. So the act of replacing one plus seven with eight is substitution. Okay, what's the next thing I need to do to get x by itself? Next thing I need to do is get rid of this four. So how do I get rid of that four? I need to divide by four. And whatever I do on one side of my equal sign, I have to do to the other. Why do I have to divide both sides? because of the division property of equality. Another one of your properties there that you have to use in lesson two six. Division property of equality says that whatever I divide one side of an equation by, I have to divide the other side by the same thing, right? And so the last thing that's left for me to do is then simplify. So these fours cancel and I'm left with x equals eight divided by four is two. And what was the reason what, what allowed me to rewrite this from this previous step? I simplified, so that's always substitution. Okay, so three pieces of this that never change. Let me see if I can find where I dropped my, oh darn it, I had a highlighter. Okay, I don't know. I use pink, I don't like pink, it's too dark, but that's okay. Um, three things that never change in a proof is that line one, is always your given. So your statement and your reason are your given. And then the statement in the last line is always your proof. It always has to match. This is your goal, you have to get to this. Here, I'm finished, I got to this, it's always my last statement. The reason isn't gonna be proved, that's not a reason. Given is a reason, why did we start with this? Because that's where we were told to start, given but everything else after we're using math rules. So why did I go from step four to step five? Because I use substitution. Hopefully that helps you guys a little bit. Let me know if you have questions.